Namaskar, good afternoon everyone. We are delighted to inform Symbiosis Law School Noida in association with Lex Witness, India's first magazine on legal and corporate affairs, THS, the law firm, and Sad Gamaya presents knowledge series on law and justice. As part of the series on June 20 and 21st, 2020, Honorable Mr. Justice C.K. Thakkar, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, and Mr. K.T.S. Tulsi, Senior Advocate and Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, delivered sessions respectfully. We are delighted to inform you that following session will be delivered as part of LEAF 2, which will be followed by special live Q&A se session. Today's session, would be delivered by Mr. Vikas Power, Senior Advocate on how to invoke jurisdiction of High Court in quashing the prosecution. Mr. Power requires no introduction, but to fulfill the ritual, let me take a few minutes of you to introduce you to this noble personality. Mr. Vikas Power, Senior Advocate has advised clients on diverse matters relating to criminal law, commercial laws, corporate laws, constitutional law, family law, and many other general laws. He has done cases in India as well as abroad. He was designated as Senior Advocate, High Court of Delhi in July 2011. Mr. Pawa has conducted series of cases involving multiple jurisdictions and needless to say, complicated questions of law. He primarily handles cases in criminal law like cases pertinent to anti-corruption laws, prevention of money laundering act, narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act, foreign exchange management act, serious fraud investigation of his cases, official secrets act, customs act, white collar crime cases, matrimonial dispute cases, preventive mm -hmm. detention matter, food adulteration act, unlawful activities prevention act, and many more. Apart from representing individual clients, he has been representing multinational corporations, banks, financial institutions, insurance companies, and many more before various courts and tribunals all over the country. Mr. Pawa, has appeared in more than 20 high courts in India and has represented clients from different spheres of law. There is much to say about the personality, but is known to everyone. So before we request Mr. Pawa to deliver the session, I would request Mr. Raj Kamal, the moderator for the today's session, to set the rules of the house for, for the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are honored and privileged today to witness the webinar on how to invoke jurisdiction of High Court in quashing the prosecution by one of the best senior criminal lawyers that we have, Mr. Vikas Pawar, sir, senior advocate. Sir, on behalf of the organizers of Knowledge Series on Law and Justice, we welcome you and all the participants to the webinar. Before we begin, please note the housekeeping rules for all the participants. This session would go on for an hour and a half the participants could put their questions in the Q&A box and we, put, and we would put it to Sir while he's addressing the topic. Please note that there will be a live question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. Please use your raise hand icon and join the queue so that we can put you live to ask your questions to Sir. We will try to address as many questions as possible. Over to you, Sir. Thank you, Raj. Uh, thank you, Professor Ravendale, for uh, uh, giving this elaborate introduction. I don't know whether uh, it was worth it or not, but uh, thank you so much uh, you know, for introducing me. I also would like to thank the Symbiosis uh, Law School, Noida, for giving me the opportunity and inviting me here today in the knowledge series on law and justice. I think it's a brilliant idea to every week to discuss some important issues both on the civil and criminal side. I think you had a brilliant start, what I was told last week. 
and you had Justice uh, Chakkar and Mr. Tulsi. And, uh, you know, they are the legends in the profession. And Justice uh, Thakkar, I remember, dealt with so many important, uh, you know, questions of law on the criminal side when he was there in the Supreme Court. So, uh, and also thank you, uh, Kumar Meer, uh, for, for organizing this. And the other people who are associated with the knowledge series on law and justice. Uh, when I read the topic for today, which is how to invoke jurisdiction of high court uh, in quashing the prosecution. I would like to tell all the participants, uh, I think majority of them will be students and also young lawyers, that uh, if you want to practice in the higher courts, particularly in the high court, then this is one jurisdiction which you must master. Because on the criminal side, at least I can uh, say with authority that 60% of cases which are pending in the high courts all over the country are either in 482 CRPC or they are writs under Article 226 or 227. But almost more than 50% are pertaining to quashing of some proceeding or the other which are pending in the lower court. So it's very important that anybody who uh, wishes to practice in the higher court should understand these powers of quashing of the high court. So the topic says quashing the prosecution. And before I, I elaborate on that, it is important that I tell you that prosecution is the second leg of the criminal justice system. The first leg is the registration of FIR and the investigation. So once the investigation is completed, the charge sheet is filed in the court and the matter is referred to uh, the magistrate or to a special judge who has the power of taking cognizance, then the prosecution starts. Although the topic says how to invoke jurisdiction of high court in quashing the prosecution, but I would like to speak about the quashing of the proceedings prior to the trial, uh, you know, proceeding begins. That is the FIR and the investigation. So we, uh, we all know that uh, there are primarily three jurisdictions which we have in the high court first is the inherent power of the high court which is given in section 482 crpc and there are two powers which come from the constitution which are the basic structure of the constitution article 2 to 6 and article 2 to 7 so if we see uh, 482 482 the language uh, given in CRPC is very interesting. I would like you to read with me so that you can understand the, the most relevant part which is given in 482. It starts with a non obstante clause. This is nothing in this court. Nothing in this court shall be deemed to limit or affect the inherent power of the High Court to make such orders as may be necessary to give effect to any order under this court or to prevent the abuse of the process of any court or otherwise to secure the ends of justice. So two things which you should mark in this section. First is the non obstante clause. Starts with nothing in this court, which gives 482 as an overriding power among the other powers given in CRPC. And the use word court to prevent the abuse of the process of the court. So power under 482 normally can be exercised when the matter is pending in the court because it is to prevent the abuse of the process of the court if the matter if the fir is registered and investigation is going on then normally this power cannot be used by the high court the only power we have is article 2 to 6 of the constitution in which we file a writ petition when we file a 482 petition in the High Court, it is uh, the nomenclature uses it is criminal miscellaneous main number dash of 2020. So it's a it's a 482 petition, and when we file a petition in the uh, in Article 2 to 6, then it becomes a writ petition. So and third is Article 2 to 7, which is the power of superintendence. So these three powers, Section 482, Article 2 to 6, Article 2 to 7, are used at various stages of the proceedings in the court. So 482, as I've already read, is used when the matter is in the court. 
when when the investigation is concluded and when when fir is registered and it is pending investigation which rc it is not filed then the power of the high court is to to quash the fir which is pending investigation with the police thus 482 will not lie in article 2 to 6 which where two writs become very important writ of mandamus and writ of sharsharare these two writs can be used for the purposes of quashing or scuttling the entire process of investigation if the high court comes to a conclusion that is an abuse of the process or it is to secure the ends of justice and then the power of superintendent under article 2 to 7 so uh, as i have told you that majority of litigation in the high court is with regard to these three petitions which we filed so there are various judgments which have been passed by the supreme court in the last about 40 50 years starting from 1960 which i will be referring to in the next few uh, few minutes to you what is important to understand is that the accused comes to the high court seeking quashing of the fir or investigation or the charge sheet or a stage of a pre trial inquiry or maybe once the charges are filed so there are five stages during which these proceedings can be emanated in the supreme uh, in the high court so we can start uh, by you know discussing various you know judgments because as i've explained to you the sections and also the writ power of the high court so we all know that the uh, landmark judgment of the supreme court is bhajan lal's case which is 1992 supreme court but prior to that there is one judgment which is very important which uh, we must understand how the law on quashing has progressed is the first judgment which was delivered on quashing was prior to 1973 court coming into uh, place when uh, the court was of 1898 you know criminal court of criminal procedure 1898 had 561a as the power which is paramaterial to section 482 the first judgment which was delivered was in 1960 which is rp kapoor versus state of punjab which you must note down this the citation is 1963 scr page 388 so in this case the supreme court was dealing with the pushing of a proceeding and it was of course a preliminary stage where uh, there was an allegation against the accused and the supreme court laid down certain categories that which are the cases in which the proceedings can be quashed so the first category which they gave was that suppose there is a legal bar in initiating a, a proceeding in the court just like we need sanction for prosecution in prevention of corruption act we need you know as section 19 of prevention of corruption act says seek sanction then you can proceed for the trial if there is no sanction for instance so there's a legal bar in moving ahead there can't be any convenience this is one ground which was enunciated by supreme court in 1960 and second ground ground or category which was given by uh, the supreme court was that if we accept the allegations of the fir as it is and no offense is made out then also we read the complete uh, you know complaint accept it as it is we don't dispute it and say that no offense is made out the essential ingredients of the offenses are not made out then also the fir can be quashed and third category which was given by supreme court in rk rp kapoor was that if the allegations are not supported by legal admissible evidence suppose there's an allegation made in the fir but there is no evidence to support that allegation so these are the only three categories which were given by supreme court in 1960 and then beyond nine after 1960 then the court changed in 1973 a new uh, crpc came then for the first time in fact there are many other judgment i would like to quote only one among them was in 1982 so from 73 to 82 till 82 rp kapoor held the ground and only on those principles the proceedings were quashed and in 1982 state of west bengal versus swapan kumar guha 1982 one scc 561 this judgment reiterated 
that even investigation cannot initiate if the FIR does not disclose the cognizable offense. That means the condition precedent to initiate the investigation by the police is the police must read the FIR and see whether the essential ingredients are present or not. Only then you can proceed further. So Swapan Kumar Guha quashed the uh, in the High Court. The FIR was caught, caught uh, quashed at a very very preliminary stage. State of West Bengal came in SLP in the Supreme Court, and Supreme Court upheld that order of the High Court. After that came Bhajan Lal. Now Bhajan Lal is something which, of course, we read day in and day out. We refer it almost every day. And I can tell the, you know, all the participants, if you Google Bhajan Lal, uh, state of uh, Haryana versus Bhajan Lal, you will find at least it's referred in thousands of judgments all over the country. So this is one judgment which I recommend everyone to read, not purely for the sake of the quashing, but also how the investigation is conducted. It's a very elaborate uh, judgment given by the Supreme Court, which deals with from from section 154 onwards how the fir is registered how the investigation is conducted and how the fir is filed with the magistrate how the entire process starts is very beautifully enunciated in that judgment and then in the end it was basically a political case uh, against mr bhajan lal who was the chief minister of haryana and when he lost the elections and uh, the 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 opponent filed a case in state of Haryana, making certain allegation of disproportionate assets against him, which was quashed by the High Court on the ground of malafides that the opponent has filed a case. So when it came to Supreme Court, Supreme Court dealt with that judgment of the High Court and ultimately laid down the guidelines, the categories, under what circumstances the FIR, the investigation, and the charge sheet can be quashed. So these are there are seven seven categories which were uh, given by the Supreme Court at that point of time and till till today from 1992 almost 38 years every high court in the country follows this judgment and see whether the quashing petition the grounds made in the quashing petition can satisfy any of these conditions. What is important is it's not necessary that all seven categories should be present in a case of quashing, even if there is one, it is good enough to quash the proceedings. So I would like to discuss all of them. Since I, if I discuss these seven categories, I think most of the participants will be able to understand the process uh, of, of how to approach the High Court uh, seeking quashing of the FIR and the proceedings emanating therefrom. First, first category is that we have a look at the FIR. Whenever a client comes to us, we have a look at the FIR and we see what are the allegations. And then we see whether those allegations make out an offense or not. For instance, a case of say 498A for instance, or a case of abetment to suicide. So when we talk about 498A, cruelty against wife by husband and his relatives, we see what are the allegations made by the complainant. Similarly, in a case of abetment to suicide, we see whether suicide has taken place or not, if suicide has taken place, then where is the allegation of instigation that somebody has instigated or abated that suicide? So we see the allegations. So first category of Bhajan Lal is read the allegations. If the allegation accepting as it is, do not make out an offense. In this case, as I am just you know hypothetically saying 498 and 306, if they are not made out, we have an option of filing a writ under Article 2 to 6, go to the High Court and say, look, I have read the entire FIR. It does not make out an offense, so it should be quashed. That's the first condition. And Supreme Court said, yes, if we look at the FIR or the complaint and no offense made out, please quash it. So it's very simple. So this is the first category, very simple category. Second category is that we move one step ahead and read the complaint and the FIR and also see the material which the complainant has provided along with the complaint. So second category of Bhajan Lal says, read the FIR or the complaint and also look at the material which is given by the complainant. 
if all three collectively do not make out an offense, again, the FIR can be quashed. Third category is now I'm I've you know tried to divide this into a very you know simplified format so that everybody can understand. FIR is one, FIR complaint and material is two. Third is FIR complaint and the evidence collected by the police. So suppose the client comes to you after six months of the FIR and says that there is no allegation in the complaint, but there are some vague allegations. And there is no material brought by him. And even police could not find anything. So then also we go to the high court. We try to convince the court and say, look, this is the complaint. There are some vague allegations. This is the FIR on the basis of which the entire process has been initiated. And the material given by the complainant is nothing. And the police also could not find anything. So third category says if all three the material is not there, evidence is not there, then the FIR and the proceedings emanating therefrom can be quashed. Fourth is if we read the complaint as it is and we find it give rise to a non cognizable offense, we all know there are two categories of offenses. First is the cognizable offense, where police has the power to arrest anyone without warrant and also can register the FIR under 154. Non-cognizable is where the police requires permission from the magistrate to conduct an investigation. So if the offense made out is only non-cognizable, then also FIR can be quashed because the provisions of law are entirely different. So fourth category. Fifth category is if we read the complaint and we find that the allegations are absurd and they are inherently improbable that even if we read the allegation, nobody, a person of sound mind would not believe that this kind of allegation can be true. So if it is totally uh, baseless, improbable, absurd, then also the FIR can be quashed. And, la and, and sixth is if there is a legal bar, as it was given in RP Kapoor, it is reiterated here, if there is a legal bar that uh, just like in Prevention of Corruption Act now, uh, Section 17A has been introduced in the amendment in uh, you know, 2018, where uh, they have said that before you initiate the investigation, take an approval from the ministry before you even start the investigation. So there is a legal bar for initiation. But if FIR is registered and the approval is not taken, then also the FIR can be quashed. And the last category given uh, in uh, Bhajan Lal is if the allegations are made because of malafide and malicious intention, which of course is a very weak category according to me, because I don't think there are cases where the FIRs are quashed purely because there's an enmity between two parties where one accused says that the allegations are, uh, you know, with malafide. And Supreme Court also, there are, there are at least a dozen judgments which says that the High Court should be circumspect in quashing the proceedings, particularly in the seventh category, because that is a matter of trial, or at least that is a matter of investigation. So therefore, courts normally do not quash the proceedings in the seventh category. So these are the seven categories on the basis of which the FIR can be, uh, you know, quashed and the other proceedings can be called. There is one judgment which I would like to only refer to, I will not deal in detail, is a judgment of Amit Kapoor versus Ramesh Chandra. This is a judgment given by Justice Swatantra Kumar in 2012-9 SCC page 460. Now, now Justice Swatantra Kumar in 2012, that was in 1992, so after roughly around uh, you know, 20 years down the line, Justice Swatant Kumar has created a couple of more categories in this judgment. There are three or four categories. But if I read it in detail, I find that all the other categories mentioned in this judgment, somehow or the other, will emanate from these seven only. He has just tried to elaborate. So I don't want to uh, deal with that at the moment, but I would like to request everyone to read that judgment to understand how the you know caution takes place is just try to simplify those seven categories so i'm not 
dealing with it, but I'm just referring it for your for your reading. With and now, yes, yes, Raj. With your permission, sir, there's a very interesting question uh, by one of the participants, Mr. Sir, Mr. Satya Prakash and Manav Mitra. They uh, want to ask about the uh, the language of 482 CRPC and uh, Article 226 and 227 of the Constitution. You know, can they be used, uh, you know, together, or what? What are the nature and uh, uh, and scope of the powers vested with the High Court under these two uh, different provisions? Sir? Okay, okay. Actually, I I, I did not deliberate uh, that in the in the beginning. I thought people must be knowing, but let me explain it to them. 482 is the power which is used by the High Court when the proceedings are pending in the court. Because as I read, when I read, I said, it says uh, to prevent the abuse of process of the court. So when FIR is being investigated, no court is involved because charge sheet is not filed. So at that stage, if you want to see quashing, then you have to find in any other alternate uh, you know, process or the procedure. Article 226, 227 is, is an extraordinary power Although, although Article 226 is the original power of the High Court, but it is extraordinary power where the High Court intervene if there is a violation of your fundamental rights. Right? So Article 226 may, there are about five writs which can be filed. Writ of habeas corpus can be filed, writ of mandamus can be filed, writ of uh, prohibition can be filed, co warranto can be filed, and shashorari can be filed. So mandamus and shashorari, these are two powers of the Constitution which can be used, these, these writs can be filed for the purpose of quashing of the proceedings. So when we are challenging the FIR, then a direction has to be given to an administrative authority, the police authority, which cannot be given under 482, which can be given only under Article 226. So it is the nomenclature which is different, but category of quashing remains the same. So Bhajan Lal, when we go to Bhajan Lal, Bhajan Lal does not uh, div, uh, differentiate between 482 and 226. Those are the powers of the court. But the principle remains the same. I'll give a very uh, you know, short example. There's a judgment of Quashing, which was filed in Allahabad High Court under 482, Quashing of the FIR. This is recent, I think, 2019. So the, uh, the additional advocate journal appeared and says, Sorry, you can't see quashing of the FIR uh, in 482 because this petition doesn't lie. 482 is, is a power which you use when the, the, the matter is in the court. But the Allahabad High Court deals with, uh, deals with the, the objection and ultimately quashes the FIR. So matter comes to Supreme Court. And it was, I think it was, it came before Justice Sanjay Kishan call about two to three weeks back. And Justice Sanjay Kishan called said, where is the problem? Why you have to spend five or six pages, seven pages purely on maintainability of the petition? The High Court could have said, okay, fine, I'm treating this petition as a red petition under Article 2 to 6. And the High Court would have dealt with this issue rather than, you know, uh, getting into this rigmarole of controversy. So idea is principle for quashing remains the same, but the powers are different. So... The Honorable Supreme Court in one single line says, we are directing you to treat this petition under 482 as a petition under Article 2 to 6, and now you please deal with it. So order, if it goes to the same Honorable Judge, he will pass the same order. But it is the provision of law which will change. So just to reiterate what I said, it is the jurisdiction of the court. We very often take an objection. I tell you the reason why we take that objection. Suppose in 482, a petition is filed for, uh, you know, seeking, seeking quashing of the FIR. And we see that this honorable judge is uh, very liberal in quashing of the FIR. So we always take an objection. Look, you can't deal with this because this is only FIR. Then uh, the court always say, Mr. Power, you're taking an objection, but let me deal with it. And I can convert it into, you know, a writ petition. I say, please do it. So when the Honorable Court converts it into a writ, then the writ roster is with somebody else. <laughs> so we get it converted into a writ, and then we tell the Honorable Court, you can't deal with this now because the roster is with somebody else, so the matter gets transferred to some other court. So these are, it's the nomenclature, 
it's the jurisdiction of the court it's the roster of the court which makes a difference the principle of quashing the categories of quashing which are given in bhajan lal remains the same thank you so much sir so one of our listener uh, anjali singhvi she asks uh, that since the language of uh, 482 crpc uh, states that at any stage can somebody approach a high court for quashing even during the time of final hearing of the trial or even after evidence has been closed sir yes yes okay i'll explain in fact i wanted to elaborate on the non obstante clause it starts with nothing in the court when we say nothing in the court means it has an overriding effect on the other provision of crpc take for instance revision the second revision is is barred by crpc and the first revision the jurisdiction lies with the court of sessions so if an accused or a complainant files a revision and he loses in the revision the second revision gets barred but there is that the law is very clear because 482 has an overriding effect starts with the non obstante clause the revisional order can be challenged in 482 before the honorable high court although the supreme court says that the high court should be use this power very sparingly but since it talks about abuse of the process of court so abuse can be at any stage of the trial it can be at a preliminary stage now what are the stages normally what are the stages of challenge let me explain it to you which will clarify that at each and every stage 482 petition can be filed so when the investigation is concluded charge sheet is filed the magistrate takes cognizance of the charge sheet under section 190 crpc so if the cognizance is bad we can challenge in the high court straight away okay second is after taking cognizance the magistrate issues summons to the accused if the summoning order is bad again you go to the high court and challenge it and then once the accused comes to the court the documents are supplied there is a discrepancy in the documents because 207 is a mandatory requirement if there is a discrepancy in supply of documents that order also can be challenged in the high court if the documents are supplied and the arguments on charge take place and charges are framed according to accused charges are wrongly framed order on charge can be challenged right and then the evidence starts once the evidence starts the prosecutor feels that he left out some evidence long time back and there is a lacuna let me fill that lacuna and bring more evidence under 311 that order can be challenged during the course of trial and court while reading the evidence comes to a conclusion that there are only three accused who are facing the trial according to the evidence available fourth accused can also come so fourth accused is called under 390 that order can be challenged under 482 and then comes once the entire evidence is over then the accused is called upon to give uh, the uh, you know statement under 313 if there is a discrepancy in that statement that order can be challenged in 482 so see till the end as uh, th- this friend of mine who has asked the question at any stage if there is an abuse of the process of the court then the 482 power can be invoked simultaneously another power which can be invoked is article 227 article 227 is the supervisory power of the high court it is a superintendence over the subordinate courts and the tribunal and other courts so which is akin to 482 which is both judicial as well as administrative so but the the courts of both the powers are different when we file simply set of 482 it is criminal miscellaneous main goes to a different roster but when we file a writ petition under article 227 it is registered as a writ petition goes to a different roster so a lawyer always gets an opportunity to choose normally in a court like delhi and other metropolitan cities that when you have an option of 482 and article 227 or 226 you choose which is a better court which is you know which is going to appreciate the law and then you file the petition thank you sir so what i wanted to elaborate if you have questions raj you can ask me now or i can go on and uh, you know just give you four or five instances where power of 482 is used 
right sir just just for just four or five instances one yes. one of the question that i found interesting sir here is that uh, supposedly in in a, in a 482 petition the high court uh, issues notice and stays the proceeding of the trial court and sir thereafter ultimately the the matter is dismissed after 10 years and during this 10 years of time sir a lot of prosecution witnesses are not available and then the the entire trial gets vitiated sir what are your views on this sir my view is that uh, in fact it doesn't happen anymore there was a time when uh, proceeding used to get stayed very very easily nowadays it becomes very tough in fact it it's the other way around what i experience as as a defense counsel nowadays is that you challenge the order of cognizance and the high court issues notice and keeps it pending now it's not decided for 5 years for instance and the proceedings are not stayed so in the meantime the accused appears takes bail he argues on charge the charges are framed and then the evidence also start in 5 years so by the time you are able to satisfy the court that it's a case where cognizance ought not to have been taken by the time you satisfy in the final arguments the majority of trial is already over this is the current situation in the country because it's very seldom you find that the trials are stayed but of course to answer your query i agree there should not be uh, cases where the stay orders keep pending for years together in fact there's a judgment of asian surfacing uh, which was argued by me in the high court where the question was with regard to stay of trials or proceedings in prevention of corruption act cases section 193c prohibits stay of any proceeding in the you know pc act cases these are special statutes where the endeavor of the legislature is to make sure that these are special category of offenses where trial should be concluded at the earliest now they have started putting a time frame of six uh, one year or two years you know in the special statutes so there of course the honorable uh, supreme court now i did the matter in the high court which is anur kumar jain versus cbi ultimately all those cases were clubbed and justice deepak mishra in the supreme court disposed of all of them by saying that no statute can say there can't be any stay but if there is a stay then in that case within 6 months the proceeding should be concluded so the the honorable supreme court in asia surfacing has clarified the law that there can't be a blanket ban of no stay that don't stay because if suppose there is a case which warrants interference which is an abuse of the process of the court but the court says sorry i want to stay but i can't stay because the act says i can't stay so the honorable supreme court says even in those exceptional cases you can stay the trial but when you stay the trial you must uh, dispose of the petition within 6 months i agree with that principle asian surfacing can in fact be cited in other cases also which are non pc act cases where the lawyers can always tell the court that the stay is pending since long so therefore it's an abuse it's now uh, the the stay which is being perpetuated is an abuse of the process of the court so kindly either you vacate it or dispose of the petition but normally it doesn't happen now now it's very seldom we we see that the trials are stayed nowadays thank you very much sir so i'll get back to you with some other questions uh, if i find okay thank you so the the normal category of cases which are being entertained nowadays by the high court i would say i will place one first category is a case where if you see the uh, the fir and the charge sheet we see that it's purely a civil dispute. We, we all see this, Raj, you and I, we, we all appear in the court, we see majority of cases where civil disputes are given a cloak of a criminal law or a criminal dispute. So those are cases which are basically commercial cases, dispute between partners and dispute between brothers, sisters. So these are cases where you will find plethora of judgments from the Supreme Court where the proceedings have been quashed. Second category of cases which I've seen recently, which have just cropped up is cases of rape where the allegation is false promise to marry. These are also cases which the courts have started understanding that, you know, this law is being grossly misused. So false promise to marry, as they say, 
uh, sometimes the 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 law in fact has been clarified that uh, false promise to marry is not rape at all so these are cases which i have recently seen in the last about 4 to 5 years have come up where the courts have started entertaining the portion petition and then third category is category of settlement settlement in a non compoundable offenses now uh, as we see section 320 crpc gives a list of cases which are compoundable in nature those are the offenses which are compoundable with the complainant sometimes with the you know permission of the court but if they are non compoundable then we have to approach the high court saying that now we have settled the matter both the parties have settled the matter so therefore kindly you use your power it's an abuse of the process of the court since we have uh, settled it will be a futile exercise to conduct the trial so you quash so there are very the large number of cases and the only dispute in those cases is which category of offense sometimes they quash 307 sometimes they don't quash 307 sometimes they quash 308 so th there is a great development which is happening in this particular field and then what is most important why why now now i want to refer something which is very very relevant is when a private complaint is filed and something order is issued or the complaints are filed where it's a summons trial where notice under 251 has to be framed these are two cases two category of cases where there is no option except to come to the high court because the magistrates have no power to recall their order i remember when i started my practice in 1993 and 94 in 1992 there was a judgment of supreme court called km matthew versus state of kerala now that was an exception to crpc and that according to me was such a brilliant judgment which says that if a magistrate has issued summons to you and summons have been served on you and you realize that that he should not have issued summons then you go to the same magistrate give him some relevant documents satisfy him and give which and this this judgment gave him the power to recall the you know summons from 1992 onwards we used to file so many applications every day and magistrate used to realize their mistake and they used to recall now after adalat prashad adalat prashad was i think 2012 or something in adalat prashad they overruled km matthew and they said sorry the magistrate doesn't have the power to do it because crpc is silent but you can always go to the high court in 482 or in article 226 227 so now see the effect of uh, overruling kr matthew that now you will go to the high court there there are two proceeding one before a magistrate one before high court and if you lose in the high court you go to supreme court otherwise the accused would have gone directly to magistrate made a request for recalling of summons so these are another category of cases like 138 cases where complainant makes all the directors as an accused and you are summoned but you have a document of which is called form 32 that you have already resigned long time back when check was dishonored you have no option except to come to the high court right so uh, judgment of adalat prashad and subramaniam setu raman these are two judgments which gives the power of uh, of coming directly to the high court now another category which is very important is that when the proceeding starts in the lower court the accused is summoned and accused has a look at the charge sheet and accused find that some very very relevant documents of uh, his his document which he gave it to the investigating officer are not forming part of the charge sheet and if he shows those documents to the court then the entire case can be quashed or entire case can be uh, you know at least prima facie proved to be absolutely false but the court says i can't have a look at your documents because the law does not permit me to have a look at your document at this stage at the preliminary stage of the trial so state of odisha versus demendra nath party says again i sometimes you don't understand these intricacies of the procedure in crpc that if you go to the trial court show those documents to the trial court the trial court will say sorry i know that these are unimpeachable documents of sterling quality but i can't have a look at it because law doesn't permit me to do it 
But if I challenge the entire case, I go to the high court under 482 and 226, 227, and I show those documents to the high court. The high court says, yeah, please show it to me. I'll have a look at it. So see, that happens because of the inherent power of the high court. Inherent power of the high court is to prevent the abuse of the process of the court. So the power is very wide and starts with the non obstante clause where it, it has an overriding effect on the entire procedure. Magistrate cannot use that power. Sessions court cannot use that power. Session court is bound by the procedure given in the act. But high court is not bound by the procedure given in the act. So therefore, this is one category where we directly go to the higher courts, see quashing by producing documents which are unimpeachable in nature and are of sterling quality, which cannot be disputed by either of the parties. Suppose there are public documents. There are documents from registrar of companies or Ministry of Corporate Affairs or they are authenticated by any court or a court judgment or a court order, which cannot be disputed by anyone. These are legal document, public document, court has to look at it. So therefore, these are uh, the, uh, you know, procedures which are normally used. I, I remember doing this case about three weeks back, where in Dr. Tharoor's case, Dr. Sunanda Tharoor death's case, there are some tweets which are in public domain. Even if I open my Twitter account and go to her you know, Twitter account, there are tweets of 2014. An account is still valid. So I wanted to refer it to the trial court. But those tweets are not filed along with the police report. The court says, I can't have a look at it. I said, it's a public document. These documents are available. Anybody can have a look at it. I can't temper with these documents. Prosecution cannot temper with these documents. But the court ultimately had that the procedure in CRPC does not permit me to have a look at your document. You go to the high court and show it to the high court. So I wanted to argue that even at the stage of charge, if my documents, which are of sterling quality, should be looked into by the court, there is a judgment of Supreme Court recently, three judges, which has clarified that even at that stage, even the trial court can have a look at it. So now the matter is pending in the high court, but see the predicament. There is a document of sterling quality which can destroy the entire prosecution case. But the court has to close his eyes and say, I can't have a look at it because I don't have the power to have a look at it. You wait for your turn. When your turn comes of adducing defense evidence, then you produce this document. But in my view, in my view, if the documents are of sterling quality, they can't be disputed, they are public documents, then the court must have a look at it because it has a bearing on the outcome of the trial. Another category of cases where we go to the high court and see quashing is a case where a departmental inquiry and criminal proceedings are going on together. And departmental inquiry results into exoneration. So there are certain set of judgments which say that if departmental inquiry results into exoneration, where the burden of proof and the principle of proof is so less where it is on pre, uh, preponderance or probability when in preponderance or probability you can't prove the charge against the delinquent officer how will you prove a charge in a criminal trial where the burden of proof is much higher to prove beyond reasonable doubt again we can't show that exoneration order to the trial court but we can straight away come to the high court and tell the high court that look these are two proceedings which were going on simultaneously wherein departmental inquiry I have been exonerated on the same facts and same evidence I'm facing the trial and ultimately I have a chance to be acquitted so why should I face the prosecution therefore the courts entertain these kind of proceedings and sometimes uh, they, they, they quash the criminal trial the landmark judgment is of PS Rajya which is 1996 9 Supreme Court page 1 and uh, there's a judgment of Radesham Kejriwal, 2011, 3 SCC 581. These are two judgments which say that if in departmental inquiry a person is uh, exonerated, then he should also be, uh, the proceeding should be quashed. Another important aspect where we come to the High Court is in special laws, like in uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe 
Act cases and uh, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act cases. There is a prohibition in anticipatory bail. Just like in UP till about 2019, there was no provision of anticipatory bail. So even if when there is a false case is filed, the accused apprehends arrest and there's a prohibition of anticipatory bail or you feel that the accused can be taken into custody, the accused challenges those proceedings in the high court and tries to satisfy the court that this is a case which does not give rise to any offense. SCST Act is not made out because of the lack of essential ingredients. UAPA case is not made out because it's not a terrorist activity. <clears throat> but case has been registered. I'm seeking caution. If the court finds uh, substance in those grounds, the court can accept the caution petition. At the same time, grant an interim relief of no course of action be taken against the accused. So indirectly, because there was a prohibition, otherwise an accused would have gone and sought anticipatory bail and would have sought discharge from the trial court. But in this case, since there is an embargo on anticipatory bail, then a, a, a remedy which is available is go to the high court, satisfy the high court, no offense is made out, and seek an interim relief. So these are few examples which I have given off the cuff, you know, which we, which we remember uh, on the basis of which we file. Now you can ask uh, Raj. You can you, you can just ask me questions uh, in case you have anything specific on portion. Sir. So one of our uh, participant, Mr. Shiv Pandey, he asks. He quotes the relevance of Section 483 CRPC. Hmm. Is it advisable to file a petition under 483 read with 482 CRPC for seeking directions for a speedy and time-bound trial? Mm -hmm. Your views, Look, sir. 4, 483 is also superintendence over the lower courts, just like uh, we, we, you know, we have Article 227. So 483 is both uh, also judicial and administrative. Of course, you can always ask for uh, a day-to-day -day trial. There are certain statutes where there is a specific provision that trial should be completed in six months or in two years. <clears throat> in PC Act, in the recent amendment which has taken place, there is a time frame which is given now. So, of course, if the, uh, if the pendency of trial affects Article 21 of the Constitution of any accused, then, of course, he can always uh, go and uh, ask for directions for speedy trial. I think most of the courts uh, will entertain that. They've been entertaining. And normally, even when we go for caution and the court doesn't agree, and the lawyer for the accused feels that it's a case which deserves caution, very often we tell the court that why don't you direct that trial should be over in six months. We know that there's nothing in this trial. So we ask for a direction ourselves. But of course, there's a huge pendency in various courts, sometimes the, the you know trials get delayed unnecessarily. We all believe that uh, in the the criminal justice system in the country should adopt to the technology, more of technology now, so that uh, you know the trials are concluded at the earliest. I remember going to Greece, where 22 witnesses are examined in one single day. In our country, 22 witnesses, unless and until these are PCI cases, 22 witnesses are examined in 10 years. So there, there, they, there they use the technology. There they don't write, they, they don't type. Just like we type the depositions in the court, we have a typewriter or a computer. We ask question, we type question, we ask answer, we type the answer. It takes a lot of time. There they call the witnesses with, and everything is digitally recorded. Just like you and I are talking, the defense asks the question to the witness, and he speaks, second question is asked, second answer comes, third is asked, third answer comes. So, you know, there the art of cross-examination is actually very, very effective. Sometimes when we have to elicit a question from a witness, we ask him irrelevant questions in the beginning, and then suddenly we bring the, the relevant one. But if you are typing each and every question, so by the time your relevant question comes, it is half an hour. But when it is digitally recorded, we are asking 
you know, extempore like this, then you can extract information from the witness. So there I have seen 20 witnesses in half a day, uh, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one witness is examined. So we should adapt to technology. If we adopt to technology, I feel that uh, most of the trials will get expedited. But answering your question, yes, washing this uh, 482 and 483 can be used for the purpose of seeking a direction for early disposal of trial. Thank you, sir. So one of our participants, uh, Professor Dr. Madhukar Sharma, he asks us about juvenile cases. Uh, yes. Supposedly, uh, uh, inquiry is initiated. Can uh, in, in such, such circumstances, can the juvenile approach the High Court under 482, sir, or there's any other alternate remedy available, sir? Uh, for, 482 talks about the court. You know, Juvenile Justice Act. If a juvenile is being tried, it has he has to be tried before a board. And all the orders which are passed by the board ultimately come higher in the hierarchy to these courts only. So, uh, for the purposes of quashing, we can always come to the high court. If suppose uh, uh, he is deprived of trial by a board, he is a juvenile, but he is deprived. The inquiry is wrongly conducted. He is actually a juvenile, but there is a document which his father made when he was young, which document is not correct. So he always say that I, I, I have to take a plea that I'm a juvenile so that I go back to the juvenile justice board. He comes to the court, the court conducts an inquiry, refers the matter to the board. So even for quashing, if, the, if, if no offenses is made out, 482 of course lies and also red petition lies under 227. You can approach the high court and see quashing. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, in fact, uh, Dr. Madhukar Sharma is online with us. And he would want to ask you a live question, if you permit, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Please, please. please. Good Dr. evening, sir. Good evening, Good evening sir. Good evening. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible, but I can't see you. Can I see your face? <laughs> that depends upon the organizer, sir. <laughs> anyway, please ask me a question. Yes, sir. Sir, okay. hearing the question with respect to the juvenile justice was, was like that. Suppose I am, I am alleged to have committed 304 offense, which is punishable up to 10 years. So recently, okay. the Supreme Court, I am not remembering the title citation of the case, wherein the Supreme Court has stated that uh, definition of heinous offense in the JJ Act is vague and the legislature need to make some amendment. Okay. So the thing is, supposedly, this is a hypothetical situation that I am alleged to have committed Section 304 offense. And post delivery of the judgment of the Supreme Court, the Juvenile Justice Board has decided to try me has decided to initiate the primary uh, inquiry against me under section 14. Now, okay. I want to seek remedy against this order of the PI to be conducted by the Juvenile Justice Act under section 14. Now, can I, should I approach under section 482 or should I approach so, the high you, court you under approach, Constitution? First you, first, you approach the same court, pass this, uh, give a copy of this judgment, and tell the court you have to conduct an inquiry under section 40 now. If he does not agree, then you come to the high court. Sir, there in my question is that inquiry cannot be conducted because section 304 should not be considered as an heinous offense. Okay. There is, there is an ambiguity in the definition clause of heinous and this is admitted by the Honorable Supreme Court in the uh, judgment delivered in the month of February. Okay. Despite of this fact, the Juvenile Justice Board has decided to initiate the PIO section 14 that should I be treated as an adult or should I be treated as a juvenile? Because the implication of this inquiry could be like this, that if I if it decides that I be treated as an adult, now the trial will be conducted by the sessions. That's right. So I made a request, I made a request before the Juvenile Justice Board that because of the this judgment of the Supreme Court, which says that there is ambiguity in the definition clause, you should not treat me, you should not treat the matter as an heinous offense and you should treat the matter as a serious offense. Okay. And the JJP has disagreed with my plea. Now what remedy will be available with me? Challenge that order. Challenge the, because you are saying that 304 is not a heinous offense. So therefore I should not be treated, my, my trial should not go to a court of sessions. I should be treated by you, by the board, because the Supreme Court has now delivered this judgment. When the board has dismissed your application, that order is amenable to challenge in the higher court. So you either file 482 or file the writ petition in Article 226 and 227. 
because but, because because the definition as you say is is vague and 304 is not considered to be an heinous offense so you should be given so there has to be a beneficial interpretation of the word heinous offense in juvenile justice act in your favor yes so come to the high court so i should approach under article 226 So two to six, two to seven, you can file a rate, and at the same time, even four eighty two will also lie. Okay, sir. So there Both is one more lie. question. If I could ask, sir. You have to ask Raj whether you are permitted to yes. ask second question or not. <laughs> For me, it's fine. <laughs> Please go ahead, sir. Right. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sharma. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, like uh, you were talking about that, uh, how the trial court is not permitted to appreciate. the any any evidence to be produced by the accused at the preliminary stage mainly yes. at the charge stage yes so uh, should it be considered as abuse of power of the court or it should be considered as lack of power of the trial court no i think there is a judgment now nityanand's judgment which is passed by justice uday lalit i think of last year it's a three judges bench which has clarified the judgment of state of odisha versus devendranath padi which says that if the judgment if the documents are of sterling quality if they can't be disputed that even at the stage of charge it should be considered so it depends suppose you want to bring in evidence which is disputed the complainant says i don't i don't agree with this order and this document which you are bringing is a false document or a false document or i deny this document then it can't be looked into but of course at the stage of framing of charges what has to be looked into according to crpc is the document which are filed in terms of section 173 sub section 5 the charge sheet and the documents re relied upon by the prosecution yes but you can always file section 91 uh, crpc application showing the necessity and desirability of that document but that document has to be a document which is unimpeachable in nature yes sir and the you know the idea is in the trial and even in uh, the investigation the idea is to find the truth if you can show as an accused counsel something which has an impact on the trial why it should not be taken into consideration so to uh, to 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 give a fair trial to the accused and to find the unvarnished truth a document which is uh, unimpeachable should be taken into consideration at any stage yes sir thank you sir thank you very much uh, sir for answering the question mr nawai with your permission i'll put uh, mr basant kumar for asking live question mr basant kumar please ask your question mr basant kumar <coughs> so we'll get back to him sir so one of the questions uh, which which has come in the q and a box uh, i would like to ask you sir is the growing tendency like we, we uh, read in all the all the uh, uh, judgments uh, that to arm twist criminal prosecution is launched in commercial matters and uh, you know essentially it's a civil uh, ma matter with civil nature so what are your views on that how can we sir uh, circumvent this sir? uh i think when uh, fir is registered which of course gives rise to only civil dispute uh then you have an option of coming to the high court directly see quashing of the fir but law is very clear sometimes even when a civil dispute give rise to a criminal offense because there is a very delicate distinction between both sometimes one transaction give rise to both so law is very clear that they are mutually exclusive they can go together and court will not intervene in quashing of those those firs but yes of course there you are able to show that it's a completely civil dispute and commercial dispute and the only objective of getting a case filed is to extract money because otherwise in civil dispute you file a suit for recovery which takes years so it's a it's a very uh, rampant uh, you know advice which is given by defense counsels particularly on the criminal side why are you wasting time on the civil side file a criminal complaint you will get your money soon so most of the time we see that this kind of uh, misuse happens 
but uh, the courts have become very cautious now and they read the complaint and they appreciate and we have some brilliant judges in the high court who just don't tolerate the conversion of civil dispute into civil and very uh, at the very threshold the proceedings are quashed thank you very much thank you sir thank you dr minakshi call for asking the question so you may continue now and then i will again ask you the question at the end of the session sir. yes thank yes you, yes no i in fact have I, i've shared in fact uh, you know i have covered almost all the points i would like to take more questions if you have sir because uh, you know these are academic uh, exercise where of course people can read and understand but if they have doubts then those doubts should be cleared if right. raj you have some questions you can yes. ask me yes, sir. sir mr simon benjamin one of our participants he i'll i'll quote sometimes yes. high courts are reluctant in quashing cases under section 482 crpc do you feel there must be new approach by high courts or changes in the existing considerations to apply this relief more often than instead of subjecting the accused to approach the trial court for a discharge what are your views sir uh i i agree with uh, simon that uh, you know it all depends you know we have various category of judges there are some judges who feel that the trial court proceeding should be given the preference because that is the foundation where uh, the truth will emanate ultimately from the, the the trial and truth will be found and there are some some judges who feel that it's a harassment so it all depends there are, uh, you know which which judge handles the matter i we we have seen or we see it almost every day there are some judges those who have not dealt with the constitutional powers suppose you know judges who come from the services from the trial court they have done trial court for them trial court is the most important thing so it is all uh, subjective according to particular judge i agree with simon it depends sometimes the judges are very proactive they believe in 482 and article 2 to 6 2 to 7 and some do not but i can only talk about law of course it all depends when you go to the court before whom you are arguing but law is very very clear bhajan lal has to be appreciated if there is no offense made out it should be quashed if it is malafide it should be quashed why should an accused face a trial for 10 years just because you feel that the that 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 the high court needs a judgment from the lower court we don't need a judgment we, you can give a judgment if we are able to show that it's a case which is an abuse of the process of the court if there is a legal bar for instance issue of sanction issue of sanction is so important that according to me although the law is very clear if there is no sanction 482 will lie but if there is an improper sanction then the supreme court says the trial will decide whether it is improper or not but recently it has happened with us we although there was a sanction but we were very very confident that this is a sanction which is no sanction in the eyes of law against all odd advices we decided to challenge it in the high court it was pending for about one year ultimately came up before an honorable judge and the honorable judge applied her mind and she quashed so although it was completely contrary to what the supreme court has said but when you see a particular case when you see a sanction which is so absurd which shows complete non application of mind even a high court judge sometimes can quash so as i said it's subjective depends upon the honorable judge but yes powers are there and uh, simon uh, is a is a defense counsel so i know his predicament when <laughs> as a defense counsel when your plea is not accepted then you always feel that yes uh, uh, you know high court judge should have granted the relief but our job is to always assist the court give the court all the requisite judgments convince to the best of our ability and then leave it to the honorable court to decide thank you thank you so much sir suraj can we take some live questions yes sir miss uh, mr mazharul islam is the last live question mr mazharul islam Uh, good evening, sir. My question is that uh, you, uh, earlier in the session you told about the uh, Sunanda 
पुष्कर केस एंड यूज ऑफ टू इट सो बेसिकली आई वॉन्ट टू नो डेट वॉट आर द प्रोविजन दैट वन सोशल मीडिया पोस्ट can be cited in the court as a evidence should it uh, should this evidence can be used against uh, the accused or not of course uh, the you know you have to see the information technology act and also see the indian, uh, indian evidence act now everything which is on net like uh, you can see the emails right if an email is written whatsapp messages are exchanged the normal sms are exchanged telephone calls are intercepted all this is electronic evidence according to me all this now because this is now now with even in covid 19 you see we all are now governed by technology around us we can't survive without technology we argue on technology the even the uh, you know cross examination of witness may happen on technology tomorrow so this this cd this uh, youtube uh, uploading of the clip everything is electronic and everything is evidence so even in social media if that social media uh, uh, clip it or news or a comment is relevant and can be proved along with section 65b certificate can be converted into a primary evidence can be used in any case anywhere in the world but of course uh, there are some laws which are governed there are some privacy laws which are uh, very very important now we have a judgment of supreme court on law you know law and privacy so we can't use everything it has to satisfy that test that it should not violate the privacy of an individual but evidence in any form any electronic form okay. is admissible uh, okay sir Fine, uh, it means public comment on facebook posts can be cited as evidence the public comment is irrelevant i am saying relevance or no relevance is a different matter whether that evidence is relevant you have to decide in terms of the facts of the case but comments made by f suppose there is a comment on on twitter made by x first of all you have to establish the identity of the x there are so many fake twitter accounts there are so many fake instagram accounts which are opened you don't know whether the face which is shown on the twitter and the uh, instagram is correct or not so authenticity of that person has to be established identity has to be established and he is an outs- how is he linked with the case that has to be established so relevance of the evidence will be decided in terms of the indian evidence act i was only talking about admissibility if it is relevant it will be admissible in evidence thank you mr pawa avinash singh please ask your question live uh, good evening sir so my question is that uh, with regards to quashing of an fir when we move the proceedings for quashing of an fir do you think it violates the adversarial system because there is a certain duty that is casted upon the prosecution to make their case right now specifically when we come to after the chat sheet has been filed it has the prosecution has done away with its role and they can prove or they have collected the evidence whether it would prove or not that is up to the court to decide the prosecution has done their job there but when we come to just the fir an fir can only be registered when a prima facie case or a prima facie or cognizable offense is uh, visible now That's after that when the court squash uh, the fir do you think it violates the adversarial system because the duty that is casted upon the prosecution is not complete okay so i think what you must read is uh, there's a privy council judgment of uh, uh, emperor versus khwaja nazir ahmed 1945 privy council so that judgment of of uh, privy council said that police and judiciary these are two independent uh, things they don't overlap they are complementary your argument is that they should complement each other the court should permit the police to complete the investigation because that's part of their statutory job to do it but if you see bhajan lal bhajan lal only says and there are many judgments of supreme court in fact uh, there is one judgment which is very relevant for your uh, query is that police can conduct investigation only if the complaint discloses cognizable offense police doesn't have a unfettered power that they will pick up one complaint 
and start the investigation file charge sheet. So first step is whether the complaint discloses cognizable offense or not. Suppose it doesn't. And the police officer wants to conduct investigation. Bhajan Lal says, sorry, FIR will be caused immediately. They don't have an unfettered power of investigation. So police should be permitted. Khwaja Nazir Ahmed says, don't interfere in the beginning. Let them do their job. Right. And then there are many, there are series of judgment. But if the FIR does not disclose a cognizable offense, one second category of Bhajan Lal was, FIR and complaint and material along with the complaint does not disclose, then you quash. Third is, third is relevant for you. FIR, complaint, material filed along with the complaint and evidence collected. If all this do not permit, then also you quash. So if first and second category is not satisfied, the third is category where police has collected the evidence. But if police has collected, but still no offense is made out, only then the FIR will be quashed. So yes, you're right. They should be given an opportunity. There are two sets of judgment of the Supreme Court. If you start collecting, you will find 30-40 in one category, 30-40 in the other category. In one category, the Supreme Court says, yes, you must quash. Second category, no police should be permitted. So as a defense counsel, as a counsel for the accused, you, you read the complaint and wait for the right opportunity. Sometimes we don't challenge the FIR at all. We wait for the investigation to be uh, completed. We wait for charge sheet to be filed and then we challenge it so that we know that police should be given ample opportunity to collect the evidence, file charge sheet. And if it is, if no offenses are made out, we challenge it in the high court. So it is not adversarial. As you say, the courts have to do their own job. Police, of course, they have prosecutors who represent them. They always oppose the quashing. It is not that the, the council goes to the court and ex party the affair will be quashed. Police is always heard. The prosecutor always opposes. Sometimes they oppose for the sake of opposition, but they do it because it's, it's part of their job to do it. So police always resist quashing and accused always say it should be quashed. Ultimately, it is decided by the court. So I don't think there's anything wrong. This is what the provision of law is all about. This is the inherent power of the court. Again, the test is prevent the abuse of the process of the court and to secure the end of justice. Mr. Himanshu Bhushan, please ask your question live. Mr. Himanshu Bhushan. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, evening. Sir, the, the state of Uttarakhand had some time back constituted a SIT to look at all disputes regarding uh, land. And uh, so in this particular case, there was a complaint made to that SIT, which did an inquiry in the matter and directed uh, the, made, uh, give information to the police and directed for lodging of an FIR. Now the police, after investigation, has filed a charge sheet saying and it has reference to the investigation by the inquiry by the SIT and based on that there has been summon, uh, summoning order has been made. Now sir, will this, the, will the complainant not approaching the police directly under 154, can that become a ground for quashing of this particular uh, FIR charge sheet and the summoning order? What are your views on that? No, uh, you are saying SIT constituted by government to inquire, SIT conducted an inquiry and then directed FIR to be registered. Yes, sir. So this, this FIR is FIR under 154. This FIR is, is FIR registered under 154. It will have the same legal sanctity as a complaint which is filed by a complainant. Sometimes the court direct. You know, it very often happens during the pendency of a proceeding in the High Court and Supreme Court that they said, you please direct this uh, FIR to be registered uh, and then investigate. So whatever complaint is available with the police, they register in the form of 154 and start the investigation. The most important thing is there should be FIR under 154. Whether it is on the basis of a complaint from a complainant or direction of a court, or after an inquiry by the police. Sometimes police register the case on their own. 
on a source information which they don't even tell. CBI register RCs day in and day out. They conduct tra uh, this traps, arrest people on the basis of some source information which they don't disclose at all, which says that it's a confidential information. The test in all these cases is whether 154 compliance has been made or not. So in your case, you have you yourself said that SIT directed registration of FIR and then 154 FIR is registered, investigation conducted, charge sheet filed. So according to me, there is no anomaly in this procedure at all. So, so, you can't see caution. Uh, so one slight interjection that yes. uh, there, there are a line of judgments which I have come across we would say that if after investigation in a particular matter, if the investigation is done by a SIT, the charge sheet has to be filed by SIT. If investigation is done by police, charge sheet has similarly to be filed by the police. Now here, okay. sir, because there is a inquiry or certainly the, uh, the investigation of police is marred by the findings of SIT. So will that have a bearing on uh, this thing, uh, on the sanctity okay, can of I, the... Can I ask a question to you? Yes, sir. Manchu, how does SIT come into the picture? So SIT is is basically constituted by the state government. So they had come out with a law saying all there were uh, there were a lot of uh, this thing instances of offences against property happening. Uh, a lot of uh, fraudulent power of attorneys and all being registered in Uttarakhand. So specifically right. to deal with that, it was not under a under which under which provision of law. SIT so, is special investigating uh, uh, special investigating team. Right. So the state government did not tell them to conduct investigation. State government tell them to conduct an inquiry. Right. Is it under the uh, this uh, uh, this inquiry commission act, or it is general inquiry? So this this inquiry is no inquiry in the eyes of law because it is not contemplated in term, in terms of CRPC. CRPC says. You can conduct preliminary inquiry prior to registration of FIR on a complaint. So therefore, the SIT has only conducted an inquiry. It, the, 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 the SIT has not conducted investigation in terms of CRPC. Investigation is done only by the local police on the basis of a complaint filed by SIT. So there's a difference. According to me, that inquiry is no inquiry in the eye of law. It is only an informal inquiry. It is like an information given by someone to the police to investigate. I but hope I am making myself clear to you because I don't know the facts. But 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 uh, FSI, I am of the view that investigation word is used only when the FIR is registered under Section 154. Anything prior to that is an inquiry. It can be conducted by local police. It can be conducted by by anybody. Just like Commission of Inquiry Act. The government appoints a commissioner to conduct an inquiry. The inquiry is conducted. After an inquiry, the commissioner may find, uh, you know, some some substance and recommend registration of FIR. I remember in Ubhar tragedy case, which we did in 1997, there was an inquiry by by the local commissioner, by the commissioner Delhi, who conducted an inquiry. In fact, multiple inquiries were conducted, and the reports were given. On the basis of that report, the investigation started. Right, sir. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, uh, we'll take a few more questions uh, before yes. concluding the session, sir. One of our participants, Mr. Manav Mitra, uh, refers uh, the question to uh, to the petition for quashing file by Mr. Arnab Goswami straight away in the Supreme Court. And, okay. and ask your view whether this practice should be deprecated, sir. I think the reason why he approached the Supreme Court is very significant for uh, the, the participants to understand. He went to Supreme Court because multiple cases were filed in the country on the basis of one single transaction. One news program, one violation, one act involved, and multiple cases filed all over the country, which is not permissible in law. So suppose he chooses to file one quashing petition in the Maharashtra High Court, and he wins. There is another one in Kerala, there is a third one in UP. So 
I have not. Uh, I mean, according to my understanding, I have not read that petition. So you go to uh, the Supreme Court under Article 32, say that the registration of all the FIRs on one transaction is an abuse of the process of the court, and it is also in violation of State of Kerala versus T T Anthony, 2007 Supreme Court, which says that there can't be two FIRs with regard to same transaction. So that's what Justice Dhananjay Chandrachud did. When you read that judgment, you will see. He kept one investigation alive in Maharashtra, and he said rest of the investigations, the FIR and the investigation, are contrary to the bare reading of uh, T.T. Anthony judgment. So therefore, they all will be quashed. So uh, all all other FIR except for one were quashed. Just like I think even uh, today in the morning, multiple FIRs registered against one of the journalists. he challenged it yesterday i just read it in the papers and the supreme court has stayed the the investigation so one transaction means one fir so i think the judgment passed by justice dhananjay chandrachud in uh, uh, his case is, is, is one of the most remarkable judgments and very judicious because he kept one case alive by saying that prima facie offense is made out let it be investigated the police will file charge you to go and cooperate And at and at the same time also protected his liberty, but quashed rest of the FIR which are not maintainable. So I think that judgment is a very sound judgment. We have an anonymous uh, listener. Can you please introduce yourself? Can you please tell us your name and ask a question live? Eight nine one nine BD zero one on screen, please. Please unmute yourself. Eight nine one nine BD zero one and introduce yourself and ask the question live. Um, hello, sir. This is Lakshika, and I wanted to ask a question from you. And my question is regarding the departmental inquiry and the criminal proceedings that are that occur simultaneously. So, how do you think can departmental inquiry be the basis for quashing criminal proceedings? as criminal proceedings as i said is not part of law is not part of process of law i think i i dealt with this issue uh, lakshika in my address in the beginning you must read ps rajya versus state of haryana 1996 9 scc page 1 which deals with your question there's another judgment 2011 volume 3 scc 581 which also deals with your question that if on one set of facts and evidence if there are two proceedings one is a departmental proceeding where the burden of proof in fact the 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 uh, the, the the test of evidence is on preponderance of probability if on preponderance of probability the charge does not stand there is a question of charge standing the test of beyond reasonable doubt that's what the honorable supreme court has held so therefore of course uh, it's very seldom you find cases where the evidence is exactly the same because both the proceedings are entirely different but in case the evidence and facts are the same then very often the high court intervene in 482 and quash the criminal proceedings uh, uh, on the basis relying upon that report given in departmental inquiry thank you mr pawar shanti ma'am please ask your question live shanti ma'am avasti Shantam, please unmute yourself and ask a question live. Uh, a very well evening, sir. Sir, uh, I uh, I just want to ask you that uh, what are the struggles that a criminal lawyer faces due to the lack of principle of full disclosure uh, from the investigating agency side, okay, or from the prosecution side? So you can uh, tell us any of your experience that how do you deal with that? Yes. yeah i think shantam is a very very interesting question and uh, this is one predicament every defense counsel has in the court and i am i am happy that you asked this question because not many people address on the doctrine of disclosure uh, although we don't have a direct law on this but i remember in manu sharma's case i i request all the participants to read a beautiful uh, address 
or Mr. Ram Jait Milani on this issue in the judgment of Manu Sharma, where he has quoted the uh, Advocates Act, he has quoted the law of England, UK law with regard to doctrine of disclosure, where uh, he says, what is the duty of a prosecutor? <clears throat> now, let me explain it to you. The, there is one is the investigating agency, the investigating officer whose job is to find the truth, right? Unfortunately, in our country, the investigating officers are not trained to find the truth. Every investigating officer feels his job is to file charge sheet in the court. Okay. So he will, a complaint is given to him and his only job is somehow I have to find evidence so that I can nail the accused, arrest him, put him behind bars, file charge sheet, etc. So first problem is there that we have to train these investigating officers that when you file, when you conduct a thorough investigation and file a report, it may be a closure report or it may be a charge sheet. It should be a report on the basis of the evidence, no matter whether it's closure or it's charge sheet. So law expect you to be independent and file a report. Then that report is given to the prosecutor. Now, when the prosecutor looks at the charge sheet, again, I have, I have a feeling, I mean, it's all a matter of training. It's all a matter of perspective. Prosecutor's job again is not to seek conviction in the case. Prosecutor's job is to assist the court to arrive at the truth. Now, to assist the court, the prosecutor, sometimes, you know, there are some very, uh, I don't have those judgment. I think it is Shiv Kumar something, judgment of Supreme Court. I can give citation to uh, Raj, you can take it from him, where it is very beautifully explained by the Supreme Court that in the, the, the prosecutor sometimes can intervene and inform the court that, look, this is the material in favor of the accused, which accused lawyer has not even seen. See the kind of independence which is expected from the prosecutor, that he will also highlight the material which is in favor of the accused, because he has to be independent. So doctrine of disclosure, which you are talking about, is a doctrine applicable to the prosecutor and the police to give and everything to the court, even that material which is in favor of the accused so that the trial can be properly conducted and it will help the court to arrive at the truth. But what is the problem? Problem is very, very often they will withhold the material in favor of the accused. Suppose they have 100 pages out of which 30 pages are in favor of the accused. Charge sheet is filed with 70 pages. And 30 pages, also, although they are available, sometimes are not filed. Sometimes are filed also, but I'm saying most of the time they're not filed because their job, their, their, their endeavor is we want to fix, we want to make sure that the accused is proved guilty. Therefore, we are handing over this material. It is a confidential material. I have a prerogative. I may file it. I may not file it. That's the training given to them. But doctrine of disclosure says, please disclose everything material, whether in favor or against. So this Manu Sharma's judgment where Mr. Jaitulani uh, you know, argued on this issue has been, there are about four or five pages which are completely dedicated to this. So you must read that. And we face problems every day. In fact, half of our address today was that we have impeachable, unimpeachable material in our favor, although sometimes it is in position of the investigating officer also, but he doesn't file it. The prosecutor does not tell the IO that please file this material because it's very relevant. If they do their job, then most of the problems are solved. And I have, I have hundreds of instances which I can discuss, but of course, sometimes they are, uh, you know, pending trials. It's not appropriate for us to speak. But coming back on what I have already stated, with regard to uh, this uh, Sunanda Pushkar's case, the tweets are available in public domain. Anybody can read it. Anybody, even... You can download it. You can take a printout. But the investigating officer will say, sorry, I have not seen it. I have not seen it. So he can take that stand because the law permits him to take that stand. But doctrine of disclosure says, please disclose whatever is material.
to the court so that court can pass an appropriate judgment so it's very very significant i hope in future this law is developed and it is taken into consideration by by the courts and appropriate judgments are passed so that it can be used in day to day but there are not many except for this uh, judgment of manu sharma which we cite day in and day out when we have to convince the court that let this material come before the court so that uh, they are considered Thank you, sir. Over to you, Mr. Rajkumar. We don't have any live questions as of now. I'll alert you if we have any more live questions. Until then, you may please take over the questions in the Q and A box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. We'll take uh, some last few questions, sir. Yes, yes, sir. One, one of our uh, participants, Mr. Rupesh Gupta, he asks a question that if an FIR is registered in Delhi and the accused lives in Mumbai. just uh, as a case of uh, like the way we go for transit bail can can he approach the mumbai high court for some relief before uh, coming to delhi high court for uh, applying a caution petition sir uh, of course uh, transit bails there is a provision of transit bail transit bails are granted when cases are registered outside your residence place if accused is resident of delhi cases in calcutta it takes time to go to calcutta so you approach the delhi court ask for protection that you are traveling and you apprehend that during the course of traveling you can be arrested so very often the courts grant 2 uh, weeks and 10 days time for you to travel and take bail uh, but this is with regard to transit bail for coaching there is uh, there is one provision which is available if the case is registered in calcutta but a part of cause of action has taken place in delhi only a part suppose there is a commercial transaction between uh, delhi and calcutta the company both companies are in calcutta and the accused is residing in delhi and one the 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 agreement which is in dispute has been signed in delhi but everything else has happened in calcutta cases filed in calcutta you can approach delhi court and ask for caution so the court where a part of cause of action or a part of offense has taken place has the jurisdiction to deal with that matter and you can file caution in that court also thank you so much uh, sir for answering the question one of our listeners uh, dr megha nagpal and mr harsh gudbani they ask a similar question sir that uh, in case of a of a complaint under section 200 crpc or at the stage of uh, of a complaint under section 1563 crpc can the accused at that time before issuance of summon or registration of an fir still go for go to the high court for uh, quashing of uh, the proceedings sir so if fir is registered you are a you are an accused one can always go the the, the important question to address is if 200 complaint is filed but something is not issued there is no summoning order if there is no summoning order of course you don't have the jurisdiction because you are not even an accused at the moment so there are various ways and means to intervene but to answer the specific query whether quashing petition can be filed or not i'm afraid it, it it cannot be filed because you're not an accused at that stage you have to wait for the learned magistrate to apply his mind and summon you if if summoning is done of course you have a right to go but if 156 the order is passed then you are an accused then that order can be challenged order can be challenged fir can be challenged both can Friends be the uh, challenged so one of the, the sorry sir uh, one of the one of the participants mr sidhan sharma asks a question sir in case of offenses uh, like uh, section 325 or in cases where uh, where deaths have occurred and uh, somehow uh, you know during the course of the trial the parties uh, the, the the de facto complainant and the accused come to a settlement and they approach the quashing uh, for quashing to the high court so in those circumstances the high court disallows the quashing petition so what are the remedies of such uh, accused person sir but why why disallow is there any offense it's, it's a non compoundable offense that's why we have to go to the high court what is offense 325 325 where sir grievous uh, injuries were there and uh, and and in a case where dowry death has occurred and uh, later on uh, yeah, okay you are talking about the heinous offenses although right. they are non they are non compoundable 
but quashing is not allowed just like in pc act cases in many other cases quashing is not allowed nowadays so those are the cases where you have to face the trial but one one simple question is suppose in the case of 325 the quashing is not allowed for some reason or the other the courts also must understand that these are two private parties where an assault has taken place if they are relegated back to the trial court they will of course not support the prosecution case because they have entered into a settlement then it will lead to acquittal so if the power of quashing is short circuiting the trial that let's not waste our judicial time because ultimately they will not support their respective cases it will result into quashing uh, sorry acquittal so therefore let's go and short circuit the entire thing so that the time is wasted the time is not wasted and the parties unnecessarily do not go to the court and uh, you know waste time so but in this case in case the court disagrees they have to face the trial and of course if they don't support the prosecution case then they will be acquitted thank you very much sir so one of our participants uh, arvind vivek uh, the question uh, that he poses is that sir if in a case of a malicious prosecution the high court allows the caution petition and and the and the uh, and quashes the proceedings in the in those circumstances uh, how can the petitioner also claim some compensation or for, uh, yes. for, for filing a malicious prosecution one has to file a suit for damages so a suit has to be filed in the civil court and you have to prove that uh, the the case was malicious and this is a result of the investigation it has resulted into closure or charge sheet has been quashed by the high court you have to prove your case of malicious prosecution and you can be given damages so the only remedy is going to the civil court thank you so much sir so i uh, i see a few uh, participants who want to ask live question mr sanju ahuja please unmute yourself and ask your question live mr sanju ahuja can you please unmute yourself and ask your question live uh, okay uh, when i uh, i need to understand this uh, that uh, uh, there is a complaint uh, uh, filed uh, and investigated under 202 crpc and uh, the police was in the process of investigation were submitted uh, were provided with certain additional uh, evidences by the accused um, as regards uh, certain facts which were not placed by the complainant under that uh, earlier complaint now the police has already filed in a report without considering those facts early uh, facts uh, submitted by the accused and police has already filed a, a complaint i mean a report before the court and um, it's pending issuance of process by the magistrate the magistrate is yet to hear the matter okay so a, a, another complaint has also been filed before the same magistrate um, which is taken under a separate uh, complaint number where the complaint the accused wants to inform the court that there are certain facts which needs to be considered i mean um, uh, and courts don't want to club both the matters together i mean i'm just trying to understand how how do you take care of such issues can should i go to the high court or what am i supposed to do okay uh, uh, i hope you understand the uh, scope of 202 crpc yeah of course 202 crpc is the power of the magistrate before whom the complaint is pending to refer the matter to the police only to assist the magistrate to find whether prima facie an offense is made out or not this is a stage before something order is passed okay so this enquiry or investigation is solely to assist the magistrate to understand the case from the perspective of the police of course your apprehension is that the police is not conducting doing a fair job in this case although they have a material in favor of the accused they are not filing before the magistrate so magistrate doesn't know what the truth is but fact of the matter is that the accused is not an accused at this stage accused is only a suspect at this stage because there is no summoning order it's a private complaint so you have to wait for your time 
suppose the magistrate takes cognizance of this report under 202 and ultimately does not issue summon to the accused then where do you stand but of course from the perspective of accused counsel being an accused counsel or the accused himself will certainly uh, apprehend that proper report is not being filed before a magistrate which may result into issuance of a summoning order so if a report is relied upon by the magistrate and summoning order is issued the only option you have is to challenge that summoning order and also the report along with the summoning order that police has not assisted the magistrate in the right perspective and the inquiry which is the basis for for issuance of summoning order is an inquiry which is biased which is partial so you have to wait for your turn you have to let the magistrate deal with this issue the moment summoning is issued you have to challenge in the high court under 482 thank you mr pawar mr sanju ahuja do you have a follow up question please unmute yourself if you have a follow up question sir otherwise we'll move on to the next person yeah, you can ask the next question mr madhukar sharma please go live and ask your question sir can i challenge section 228 uh, in light of article 14 because the thing is that till uh, when the police is investigating against me i am given the option to present my case before the police i can give 161 statement i can present any evidence before the police so opinion of the police is finalized under section 173 so till this point accused as an accused i am given the opportunity so i can say that my right to equality equality against the prosecution is is still being protected but as soon as magisterial cognizance of 190 or 204 summon of the magistrate or charge stage appears i am mm -hmm. i am denied of this opportunity to present my case before the to present any evidence before the before the trial court judge so right. can i challenge that it is violating my right to equality under article 14 no you must understand the uh, procedure given in the act you know we have we are governed by the procedure so and all these procedures have tested have been tested in the supreme court the constitutional validity all, almost each and every provision of crpc has been challenged at least once and this is the procedure procedure is that uh, uh, you know you have to wait for the right time this is what we were discussing in the last about one and a half hours that accused has certain material which has a clinching effect on the entire prosecution case and he wants to give it to the police if he gives it to the police we have already discussed that there is a doctrine of disclosure he should have disclosed it if he has not disclosed it the prosecutor should disclose it so these are the statutory obligations of the prosecuting agency which they should do it so we expect the court expect that they will be truthful in their job the court expect that prosecutor will bring that material and produce it before the court but if it is not done then and cognizance is taken you can straight away go to the high court and put that material before the high court we have already discussed there are judgments that high court can look into that material if it is unimpeachable and is of sterling quality so you are now getting the the opportunity to place your version the defense version place the material at the very threshold when charge sheet is filed and then when cognizance is taken again you can bring it so all all the judgments of supreme court says yes the honorable high court has the power to entertain these documents but the trial courts do not have the power to accept your document at this stage but i have mentioned to you there is a case of nityanand at the stage of framing of charge if those documents are unimpeachable are not uh, disputed then even that court can have a look at it so you don't need to challenge any provision you are getting so you are you are getting more than ample opportunities now this law has developed in 20 years before 20 years you did not you were not supposed to get any opportunity at all but the law has grown in the last 20 years and law has developed the law has understood that no the accused cannot be deprived this opportunity so therefore relying on those judgments you can 
challenge the proceeding at any stage, at the stage of FIR, at the stage of charge sheet, cognizance, summons, framing of charges. There are so many opportunities that are given to you now. Thank you, Mr. Pawa. Uh, in the interest of questions being received, I seek permission from Mr. Pawa and Professor Ramandale to increase the webinar duration by 15 more minutes. I've known we've overshot already, but just to address the last few questions, uh, I'm seeking permission from Mr. Pawa and Professor Ravandle yep. for 15 more minutes. I am fine. You have to ask, uh, you know, Professor okay. Ravandle whether he is comfortable sitting and watching us because sometimes you get bored looking at few few faces. So, so if he's okay with him, I'm okay. I have no difficulty at all. It is pleasure if the learning continues. So as it is ongoing, so I won't mind extending it by 15 more minutes, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Pawa and Professor Ravandle. Mr. Avinash Singh, please ask your question live. Sir, my question is with regards to the source of evidence. Now in India, the criminal justice system does not lay any heed to from where have you gathered the evidence. And it was argued uh, by Mr. Venugopal in the Supreme Court in the Rafael case that the evidence that has been gathered is illegally gathered. And the Supreme Court said that it does not matter how the evidence is gathered as long as we can look at the evidence itself and the nature of the evidence. So do you think that it can lead to a travesty of justice in an ample of case, specifically citing CBI versus Tapan Kumar, in which the evidence was collected first and then the FIR was registered. So in such cases, do you think that in India also we should have a fruit of the poisonous tree exception so that we can hold the prosecution accountable for what they're doing while collecting the evidence and building up their case? I think unlike US, what you are saying is the law which is prevalent in United States, where uh, I think day before yesterday I was watching some serial in Netflix, where uh, the evidence which was being used against a particular accused, uh, that evidence was given by a lady and the lady came to the accused and says, look, I can protect you if you do this particular job for me. So this accused asked her, what do you want? She said, I want this. So she said, what will you do? She says, I will prove that, that the chain of custody was broken with regard to these documents. And when you are able to prove that the chain of custody is broken, then that evidence cannot be relied upon. Because then there's a presumption that this evidence must have been tempered with, right? In our country also, Something like this prevails, but there is a law which prevails, which says that no matter who is giving you the evidence, I think there is a landmark judgment. I'm just forgetting the name. It's, it arises from income tax case where uh, during a uh, uh, income tax rate, rate, which is declared unlawful and illegal results into uh, collection of some evidence <coughs> and the Honorable Supreme Court says although we are declaring that this raid was illegal it was without any basis it is unconstitutional but the evidence which has been collected is important so it can be used against the accused persons that law uh, is, is, is law of the land even today in numerous cases we have seen that the, the evidence, uh, you know, which is collected by way of an illegal method, uh, that, that, that method, that search, etc., is totally uh, uh, quashed. But, uh, just a second, there is a problem. But the evidence is used. I think I am now reminded of one very, uh, very nice judgment, which I recently read from a division bench of Bombay High Court. So I request Parth. Parth is the one I think who asked the question. You must read that judgment. It's a beautiful reading where the telephonic conversation, telephonic conversations which are, uh, you know, tapped are under the uh, this Telegraph Act, Indian Telegraph Act. And you have to take permission from the Ministry of Home under Section 5. So this case was case under Prevention of Corruption Act where telephone were tapped and what the accused had challenged before the division bench of Bombay High Court was that this is violative of my right to privacy. So according to this nine judges judgment of Supreme Court, Puttu Swami's case, he tested, he challenged those orders before the uh, Bombay High Court and Bombay High Court after, you know, dealing with the entire law, declared that 
the orders passed by the ministry of home are illegal and improper therefore they are they are they quashed second limb of uh, you know question which they dealt with recently was that what will happen to the evidence what will happen to the telephonic conversation which has been recorded they said if the basis of recording of telephonic conversation has been set aside and quashed where is the question of relying on this material and they set aside and they directed that the cds which are recorded with regard to the telephonic conversation should be destroyed now it's a wonderful reading when i read that judgment i was very excited but within a week that order was challenged in the supreme court and the order is stayed it is only stayed it has not been overruled but it is it's a very significant judgment i think it's a it is towards what you are saying that how can you rely upon a material if the very basis of collection of that material is unconstitutional or illegal so i i i i recommend that you read that judgment of division bench of the bombay high court it's an interesting reading i hope the same line of argument is taken in the supreme court and if it is upheld it will be the law thank you mr pawar mr parth sharma please unmute yourself and ask your question so good evening sir sir my question is uh, whether section 482 crpc will lie in the cases of pc act because uh, the cases uh, which are in which the accused are prosecuted under the provisions of pc act they are tried in a special court and uh, revision lies against the order of the special court before the high court so will 482 lie in pc act cases sir i think there is a error in your question the law is that revision doesn't lie in terms of section 19 482 will lie it's the other way around your question should be whether revision lies or not but revision is barred under section 19 of prevention of corruption act 193 c and uh, this this question was raised for for many years i was the standing counsel of cbi during that period and before me i used to handle almost 30 40 cases a day of of criminal revisions all of them were clubbed and uh, justice deepak mishra then was the chief justice of delhi high court he dealt with that issue and he ultimately declared that revision doesn't lie in prevention of corruption act cases but 482 and article 227 226 will lie because article 226 227 are basic structure of the constitution you can't change them no statute can curtail the power of the constitution that stays and 482 starts with nothing in this court so even that power cannot be curtailed by a statute so therefore the answer to your question is revision doesn't lie against order on charge but 482 and the red petition lies this is asia resurfacing i mentioned about this in the beginning you must read that judgment thank you mr pawar please ask your question live from hyderabad please go ahead and ask your question mr johnson sir uh, reforms in land registration and uh, land records updation is taking place in our telangana Okay. So, uh, for the past uh, three decades, uh, the ROR (Revenue of Records), then the updation of records, and Section 1B and 13B are being updated from the Setwar. That is the settlement happened 1951, sir. So the family name is as it is, exploiting the family name. Currently, my cousin, a student. just a pg student but he is a legal major he started selling lands so the okay. police has become hand in glove because police is getting free money um, out of the illegal sale and uh, we have become a mute spectator at his uh, whims and fancies and uh, we have uh, filed a criminal trespass case and uh, also some abuse happened and uh, uh, meaning Uh, beyond war of words and he has been aggressive and the entire village atmosphere also knows whose lands are there but at the same time legally he has uh, he, he is claiming wrongfully papers claiming the surname and uh, and started selling what is the recourse sir and uh, what, what can what crpc or ipc can be pressed into so that uh, 
our uh, yes, case can yes, be Mr. Johnson. I'll, Mr. Johnson, I'll answer your question. I can understand your predicament. Yes, when sir. you know that a crime is being committed, you have filed uh, FIR, but police is not doing their job. Yes, sir. Right. So what you can you have you have two options. First is you go to the learned magistrate of your area, file an application under 156.3, okay. who the magistrate has the power to supervise the investigation. There is a judgment of Supreme Court Sakiri Vasu versus State, which gives them the power to supervise what is happening. They can always call the SHO of that area and ask him why you're not doing your job. And this, this uh, you know, complainant has a grievance. So you please come and give me the status report of what all you're doing. So this is the best course of action which is available to you. Second is if the magistrate also doesn't do anything, then you go to the High Court of Telangana, yes, file sir. a writ petition and say that there is a collusion between the complainant and the police and they are not conducting their job. They are also making money out of this deal. So please direct a departmental inquiry against them and transfer the investigation to some other authority who are competent to do this job. These are two available uh, remedies which are available to you. Sir, what about the revenue divisional officer who is trying to evade the situation when it is his power and authority that he can... Uh, update the Pahanis, Pahani Patrikas, which are the land records, uh, because my father is still existing and there is no sale or gift or any further transfer of property. So when records are still existing and the cess has been paid for the last three decades, land cess has been paid for the last three decades, till the cess was collected. And uh, Revenue Divisional Authority is the appropriate authority to update the land records. He is also saying, uh, go to high court. This is a land uh, land uh, civil dispute. So, uh, what about uh, making RDO as a party and uh, invoking any other section, sir? If the revenue authority is also hand in glove with an accused and they are abusing their official position, suppose he is duty bound to do something which is not doing to give benefit to a third party, and he is also taking bribe or something then you can file a case under Prevention of Corruption Act. You can file a private complaint also nowadays. Earlier it was not very prevalent. Now even private complaints under Prevention of Corruption Act are entertained before a special judge. So that happens only when a crime is committed. But if he is lackadaisical in his approach, he is not doing anything but not committing any criminal offense, you can only file a representation to a higher authorities and make a complaint against him that he is not doing his official duty. But of course, if crime is committed, you can file a case against him also. So you go to a magistrate against your uh, relative, high court against your relative, representation against the revenue authority. But if revenue authority is hand in glove, committing an offense, then file a complaint against them also. Thank you, Mr. Pava. Mr. Rajkamal, uh, we can now conclude the webinar uh, unless you have any questions in the Q&A box. To all the attendees who are still in the waiting queue, uh, we really apologize because we've overshot uh, by at least half an hour, 40 minutes. And we have another webinar to start in another 15 minutes. We will take your questions mm -hmm. offline. You can email them to the instructions provided to you on your confirmation emails. Over to you, Mr. Rajkamal. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for giving such an enlightening uh, lecture, sir. Now I will invite uh, Dr. Professor C.J. Ravandle, sir, to address the concluding remark and after which my uh, co-host and colleague, Mr. Kumar Mihir, will address the vote of thanks, sir. Thank you. Professor Ravandle, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much for the lecture which you delivered. And I would like to make uh, one point to your... Uh, uh, advice that you know what does it take to be a good listener because when one speaks what does other do well of course the patient hearing and second is the quick learning are the two things which he tests every now and then and he takes it further so thank you very much for bringing that to my notice and i really enjoy it and i always share with uh, each and every one that uh, a person who comes forward to share his thoughts or her thoughts, one just needs to invest what is called time. And if they invest it, they learn. But if they consider it as wastage of time, they never will learn. So learning should be always 
everywhere in every place and you stand for that because the way you have dealt with the course and the subject and i could see the questions which have been asked and i must uh, inform you sir that we received number of questions which were more than what we received in the first two sessions so it does not mean that you did not answer those rather you created that jeel amongst everyone and they came up with lots of questions which were pertaining to the talk which you delivered now i'll just make two submissions because when we talk about law people refer it differently but end of the day law's aim is justice or administration of justice but we greatly have been how lost ourselves into what is called as whether it is substantive law or it's a procedural law but we have forgotten that every law is backed with justice equity and good conscience and there are two principles of equity which stand for the today's talk the first principle says one who claim justice must come with clean hands and at the same time there is another principle of equity which says law helps those who are vigilant about their rights means when you claim that something has happened you need to stand for it so there is a provision for that and against whom you cite you need to prove that is not in citing it or bringing it with clean hands and the whole discussion i could feel that it was revolving around these two principles of equity which come between justice and good conscience as well equity people feel that it has lost its importance but i think that it is the wisdom of the time that it prevails in all the judgments and that's what we have been seeing every now and then and thank you very much sir because the way you have dealt with it because yes sections when i was a student of law sections did not matter to me because i did not understand what that section means but i realized it only when my teachers were explaining that concept to me i can i started considering section as a one more concept in addition to the earlier one and then we started learning law and the way you related the section uh, of under criminal procedure code and then in the line of the provisions under the constitution of india and then you also made cross references to several sp special laws as well and how minutely you bring out that difference that shows not just your preparedness but your devotion to the field people may call it as a criminal law it's a great learning field rather i must say and thank you very much for this uh, session and we really enjoy it and uh, we would like to have more sessions by your good self in future as well and on behalf of everyone at uh, symbiosis international deemed university the symbiosis law school noida i profusely uh, give my thanks to you and uh, as i said we would be obliged to have you among us time and again to deliver your thoughtful sessions thank you sir Thank Over you. to you, Mihir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Power. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving such a uh, such an enlightening and erudite lecture, sir. I would also like to thank today's moderator, my friend uh, Raj Kamal, for moderating this session. Uh, I would like to thank our supporters, uh, Lex Fitness, uh, PHS, the law firm, and Sadgamaya, which out who support this uh, series would not have been possible. and lastly i would like to thank my own uh, college led by my own teacher professor uh, ravandle who gave us this support and gave us uh, his blessings to start this series without whose uh, support and backing this series would not have been possible lastly i would like to thank all the participants without whose presence and without whose uh, in encouragement this series would not have been possible and i would request them to register for the next week series also uh, thank you everyone and uh, thanks a lot sir uh, mr sachin over to you thank you thank you thank you so much uh, mr kumar mehir thank you so much mr vikas pawa on behalf thank of lex for having me over yeah uh, we truly value your time and more and more time in fact we were shot by at least 90 minutes and i must mention this that it's very rare to see such a high engagement level by attendees uh, when a webinar is over shot uh, we truly appreciate your inputs to this webinar can i say can i say only one thing 
yes, you know please. what is what is significant uh, which i have seen in the last about say 3 to 4 months is that during this period of lockdown one thing which has become very prevalent are the webinars and i have seen lot of uh, advocates senior advocates who have now turned into teachers yes you know it is a great experience which uh, we have never uh, you know tried our hands on before and it, it's not easy to come and start speaking you, you you know you have to start enjoying this and when you start enjoying this you will see that you don't even have to look at your watch sometime like i think we have done more than 2 hours and uh, we we all have enjoyed it because that's the way we discuss and you know law also develops like this it's a great great learning experience for the students where you find you know people like mr tulsi justice thakkar coming up and now you have series of you know lovely speakers who are coming it's a great exposure for the students this i think it was never available to anybody before so this is the silver lining Uh, of this lockdown period although it's a very difficult time for everyone we all are locked up at our places but uh, this is an optimum use of period this is the most productive time i feel we argue cases nowadays also in the court but uh, this is the most productive time according to me that you come up and uh, start sharing your view- views with your colleagues so uh, congratulations to you professor for starting this knowledge series on law and justice and uh, my my best compliments to you and also you know best of luck for the future endeavors and i'm i'm quite sure participants must be delighted to to see something like this every week so thank you for thank having you, me over and uh, congratulations you, for, for holding this